Chapter Eleven. In the Dark Castle. When the meal, which was pigeon pie, cold ham, salad, and cakes, had been brought, and all had drawn their chairs up to the table and begun, the night continued. You must understand, friends, that I know nothing of who I was and whence I came into this dark world. I remember no time when I was not dwelling, as now, at the court of this all but heavenly queen. But my thought is that she saved me from some evil enchantment and brought me hither of her exceeding bounty. Honest Frogfoot, your cup is empty. Suffer me to refill it, and this seems to me the likelier, because even now I am bound by a spell from which my lady alone can free me. Every night there comes an hour when my mind is most horribly changed, and after my mind, my body. For first I become furious and wild, and would rush upon my dearest friends to kill them. If I were not bound, and soon after that, I turn into the likeness of a great serpent, hungry, fierce, and deadly. Sir, be pleased to take another breast of pigeon. I entreat you. So they tell me, and they certainly speak truth, for my lady says the same. I myself know nothing of it, for when my hour is past. I awake forgetful of all that vile fit, and in my proper shape and sound mind, saving that I am somewhat wearied. Little lady, eat one of those honey cakes which are brought for me from some barbarous land in the far south of the world. Now the queen's majesty knows by her art that I shall be freed from this enchantment when once she has made me king of a land in the overworld. And set its crown upon my head. The land is already chosen, and the very place of our breaking out. Her earthmen have worked day and night, digging away beneath it, and have now gone so far, and so high that they tunnel not a score of feet beneath the very grass the updwellers of that country walk. It will be very soon now. That those uplanders' fate will come upon them. She herself is at the diggings tonight, and I expect a message to go to her. Then the thin roof of earth, which still keeps me from my kingdom, shall be broken through, and with her to guide me, and a thousand earthmen at my back, I shall ride forth in arms, fall suddenly on our enemies, slay their chief man. Cast down their strong places, and doubtless be their crowned king within four and twenty hours. It's a bit rough luck on them, isn't it? Said Scrub. Thou art a lad of wondrous quick-working wit! Exclaimed the knight. For on my honour, I had never thought of it so before. I see your meaning. He looked slightly, very slightly troubled for a moment or two. But his face soon cleared, and he broke out with another of his loud laughs. But fie on gravity! Is it not the most comical and ridiculous thing in the world to think of them all going about their business, and never dreaming that under their peaceful fields and floors, only a fathom down, there is a great army ready to break out upon them like a fountain, and they never to have suspected. Why, they themselves, when once the first smart of their defeat is over, can hardly choose but laugh at the thought. I don't think it's funny at all," said Jill. "I think you'll be a wicked tyrant." What? said the knight, still laughing and patting her head in a quite infuriating fashion. Is our little maid a deep politician? But never fear, sweetheart. In ruling that land, I shall do all by the counsel of my lady, who will then be my queen too. Her word shall be my law, even as my word will be law to the people we have conquered. Where I come from," said Jill, who was disliking him more every minute, "they don't think much of men who are bossed about by their wives." 
shalt think otherwise when thou hast a man of thine own, I warrant you, said the knight, apparently thinking this very funny. But with my lady, it is another matter. I am well content to live by her word, who has already saved me from a thousand dangers. No mother has taken pains more tenderly for her child than the queen's grace has for me. Why, look you, amid all her cares and business, she rideth out with me in the overworld many a time, and oft to accustom my eyes to the sunlight. And then I must go fully armed, and with visor down, so that no man may see my face, and I must speak to no one. For she had found out by art magical that this would hinder my deliverance from the grievous enchantment I lie under. Is not that a lady worthy of a man's whole worship? Sounds a very nice lady indeed, said Puddleglum in a voice which meant exactly the opposite. They were thoroughly tired of the night's talk before they had finished supper. Puddleglum was thinking, I wonder what game that witch is really playing with this young fool. Scrub was thinking, He's a great baby, really. Tied to that woman's apron strings, he's a sap. And Jill was thinking, He's the silliest, most conceited, selfish pig I've met for a long time. But when the meal was over, the knight's mood had changed. There was no more laughter about him. Friends, he said, my hour is now very near. I am ashamed that you should see me, yet I dread being left alone. They will come in presently, and bind me hand and foot to yonder chair. Alas, so it must be, for in my fury, they tell me, I would destroy all that I could reach. I say, said Scrub, I'm awfully sorry about your enchantment, of course, but what will those fellows do to us when they come to bind you? They talked of putting us in prison, and we don't like all those dark places very much. We'd much rather stay here till you're better, if we may. It is well thought of, said the knight. By custom, none but the queen herself remains with me in my evil hour. Such is her tender care for my honour that she would not willingly suffer any ears but her own to hear the words I utter in that frenzy. But I could not easily persuade my attendant gnomes that you should be left with me. And I think I hear their soft feet even now upon the stairs. Go through yonder door. It leads into my other apartments, and there either await my coming, when they have unbound me, or, if you will, return and sit with me in my ravings. They followed his directions, and passed out of the room by a door which they had not yet seen opened. It brought them, they were pleased to see, not into darkness, but into a lighted corridor. They tried various doors and found what they very badly needed, water for washing and even a looking-glass. He never offered us a wash before supper, said Jill, drying her face. Selfish, self-centred pig. Are we going back to watch the enchantment, or shall we stay here? said Scrub. Stay here, I vote, said Jill. I'd much rather not see it. But she felt a little inquisitive all the same. No, go back, said Puddleglum. We may pick up some information, and we need all we can get. I am sure... That queen is a witch and an enemy. And those earthmen would knock us on the head as soon as look at us. There's a stronger smell of danger and lies and magic and treason about this land than I've ever smelled before. We need to keep our eyes and ears open. They went back down the corridor and gently pushed the door open. It's all right, said Scrub meaning that there were no earthmen about. Then they all came back into the room where they had supped. The main door was now shut, concealing the curtain between which they had first entered. The knight was seated in a curious silver chair, 
to which he was bound by his ankles, his knees, his elbows, his wrists, and his waist. There was sweat on his forehead, and his face was filled with anguish. Come in, friends, he said, glancing quickly up. The fit is not yet upon me. Make no noise, for I told that prying chamberlain that you were in bed. Now, I can feel it coming. Quick, listen while I am master of myself. When the fit is upon me, it well may be that I shall beg and implore you with entreaties and threatenings to loosen my bonds. They say I do. I shall call upon you by all that is most dear and most dreadful. But do not listen to me. Harden your hearts and stop your ears, for while I am bound, you are safe. But if once I were up and out of this chair, then first would come my fury, and after that, he shuddered, the change into a loathsome serpent. There's no fear of our losing you, said Puddleglum. We've no wish to meet wild men or serpents either. I should think not, said Scrub and Jill together. All the same, added Puddleglum in a whisper, don't let's be too sure. Let's be on our guard. We've muffed everything else, you know. He'll be cunning, I shouldn't wonder, once he gets started. Can we trust one another? Do we all promise that whatever he says, we don't touch those cords? Whatever he says, mind you. Rather, said Scrub, there's nothing in the world he can say or do. That'll make me change my mind, said Jill. Hush, something's happening, said Puddleglum. The knight was moaning. His face was as pale as putty, and he writhed in his bonds. And whether, because she was sorry for him, or for some other reason, Jill thought that he looked a nicer sort of man than he had looked before. Ah, he groaned. Enchantments, enchantments, the heavy, tangled, cold, clammy web of evil magic, buried alive, dragged down under the earth, down into the sooty blackness. How many years is it? Have I lived ten years, or a thousand years in the pit, maggot men all around me? Oh, have mercy, let me out, let me go back. Let me feel the wind and see the sky. There used to be a little pool. When you looked down into it, you could see all the trees growing upside down in the water, all green, and below them deep, very deep, the blue sky. He had been speaking in a low voice. Now he looked up, fixed his eyes upon them, and said loud and clear, Quick! I am sane now. Every night I am sane. If only I could get out of this enchanted chair, it would last. I should be a man again. But every night they bind me, and so every night my chance is gone. But you are not enemies. I am not your prisoner. Quick, cut these cords. Stand fast, steady, said Puddleglum to the two children. I beseech you to hear me, said the knight, forcing himself to speak calmly. Have they told you that if I am released from this chair I shall kill you and become a serpent? I see by your faces that they have. It is a lie. It is at this hour that I am in my right mind. It is all the rest of the day that I am enchanted. You are not earthmen, nor witches. Why should you be on their side? Of your courtesy, cut my bonds. Steady, 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 said the three travellers to one another. Oh, you have hearts of stone, said the knight. Believe me, you look upon a wretch who has suffered almost more than any mortal can bear. What wrong have I ever done you, that you should side with my enemies to keep me in such miseries? And the minutes are slipping past. Now you can save me. When this hour has passed, I shall be witless again. The toy and lapdog, nay, more likely the pawn and tool, of the most devilish sorceress that ever planned the woe of men. 
and this night, of all nights, when she is away, you take from me a chance that may never come again. This is dreadful. I do wish we'd stayed away till it was over, said Jill. Steady, said Puddleglum. The prisoner's voice was now rising into a shriek. Let me go, I say. Give me my sword. My sword. Once I am free, I shall take such revenge on earthmen that Underland will talk of it for a thousand years. Now the frenzy is beginning, said Scrub. I hope those knots are all right. Yes, said Puddleglum. He'd have twice his natural strength if he got free now. And I'm not clever with my sword. He'd get us both, I shouldn't wonder. And then Pole, on her own, would be left to tackle the snake. The prisoner was now so straining at his bonds that they cut into his wrists and ankles. Beware, he said, beware. One night, I did break them. But the witch was there that time. You will not have her to help you tonight. Free me now, and I am your friend. I am your mortal enemy else. Cunning, isn't he? said Puddleglum. Once and for all, said the prisoner, I adjure you to set me free. By all fears and all loves, by the bright skies of Overland, by the great lion, by Aslan himself, I charge you. Oh, said the three travellers, as though they had been hurt. It's the sign, said Puddleglum. It was the words of the sign, said Scrub more cautiously. Oh, what are we to do, said Jill. It was a dreadful question. What had been the use of promising one another that they would not on any account set the knight free if they were now to do so the first time he happened to call upon a name they really cared about? On the other hand, what had been the use of learning the signs if they weren't going to obey them? Yet could Aslan have really meant them to unbind anyone? even a lunatic, who asked it in his name. Could it be a mere accident? Or how, if the queen of the underworld knew all about the signs, and had made the knight learn this name simply in order to entrap them? But then, supposing this was the real sign, they had muffed three already, they daren't muff the fourth. Oh, if only we knew! said Jill. I think we do know, said Puddleglum. Do you mean you think everything will come right if we do untie him, said Scrub? I don't know about that, said Puddleglum. You see, Aslan didn't tell Pole what would happen. He only told her what to do. That fellow will be the death of us once he's up. I shouldn't wonder. But that doesn't let us off following the sign. They all stood, looking at one another with bright eyes. It was a sickening moment. All right, said Jill suddenly. Let's get it over. Goodbye, everyone. They all shook hands. The knight was screaming by now. There was foam on his cheeks. Come on, Scrub, said Puddleglum. He and Scrub drew their swords and went over to the captive. In the name of Aslan, they said, and began methodically cutting the cords. The instant the prisoner was free, he crossed the room in a single bound, seized his own sword, which had been taken from him, and laid on the table, and drew it. You first, he cried, and fell upon the silver chair. That must have been a good sword. The silver gave way before its edge like string and in a moment a few twisted fragments, shining on the floor, were all that was left. But as the chair broke, there came from it a bright flash, a sound like small thunder, and, for one moment, a loathsome smell. Lie there, vile engine of sorcery, he said, lest your mistress should ever use you for another victim. Then he turned and surveyed his rescuers, and the something wrong, whatever it was, had vanished from his face. What? he cried, 
turning to Puddleglum, do I see before me a marsh wiggle, a real, live, honest, Narnian marsh wiggle? Oh, so you have heard of Narnia after all, said Jill. Had I forgotten it when I was under the spell? asked the knight. Well, that and all other bedevilments are now over. You may well believe that I know Narnia, for I am Rillian, Prince of Narnia, and Caspian, the great king, is my father. Your Royal Highness, said Puddleglum, sinking on one knee, and the children did the same. We have come hither for no other end than to seek you. And who are you, my other deliverers, said the prince to Scrub and Jill? We were sent by Aslan himself from beyond the world's end to seek your highness, said Scrub. I am Eustace, who sailed with him to the island of Remandu. I owe all three of you a greater debt than I can ever pay, said Prince Rillian. But my father, is he yet alive? He sailed east again before we left Narnia, my lord, said Puddleglum. But your highness must consider that the king is very old. It is ten to one. His majesty must die on the voyage. He is old, you say. How long, then, have I been in the power of the witch? It is more than ten years since your highness was lost in the woods at the north side of Narnia. Ten years, said the prince, drawing his hand across his face, as if to rub away the past. Yes, I believe you, for now that I am myself, I can remember that enchanted life, though while I was enchanted, I could not remember my true self. And now, fair friends, but wait, I hear their feet. Does it not sicken a man, that padding, woolly tread? Fuh! On the stairs. Lock the door, boy, or stay. I have a better thought than that. I will fool these earthmen, if Aslan gives me the wit. Take your cue from me. He walked resolutely to the door and flung it wide open. <laughs>